Okay, I want to return tonight to the church. Let me give you, get you up to speed on my thinking in this series. Um, I don't really think it out too much in this one from week to week. I, I, I'm almost, to be very honest, I'm almost at a catch between feeling like I've walked down this road of, of study in the church pretty sufficiently, but not yet landing in my spirit on the next thing. But I get this impression in my spirit that there's something out there ahead of me. And I keep going into every week thinking this is the week I land on it. And if I don't land on it, what am I going to do? And then each week, literally for the last three, I think, I've went into that week thinking, okay, whatever it is the Father has is coming out this week. It doesn't. And one more message on the church falls out. And so just full disclosure, I don't know if this is the last one because I'm going to go into this week the same way I went into the last three weeks, which is, okay, Father, I feel that I'm just right up next to the next thing, but I'm not there yet. Maybe like I got one more cornered around. Um, when I arrive, I'll know. At each, each of these stops along the way, I've known, and, and we always do. But, uh, so in the meantime, I'm playing it by ear. I'm just walking this out one step at a time. This word was birthed this past week with the thought that I haven't walked you through from an overview on the book of Acts and really just picked out all the spots where the church gathers itself. I, we've done all kinds of stuff in the book of Acts, but I haven't had that sort of 30,000 foot view looking down into that book and, and then say out of that book across the New Testament and went church, 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 church. And sometimes that stuff can just be exhaustive. I mean, it's like, it's like running a concordance check on the word church. And, and a bunch of them is just, it doesn't really, it's not really relevant. So I don't want to do that. That's no fun. Um, at the same time, I wanted to sort of try to close Acts because we moved out of Acts last week, but I didn't feel like we'd given its proper goodbye, which is maybe ironic because there is no real proper goodbye to Acts. Acts is a book, it's one of the only books. In fact, I'm gonna say this and then I'm gonna be proven wrong, but I'm winging this off the top of my head. I think it's the only book of the New Testament that doesn't end with an amen. Um, and I know it doesn't end with an amen. What I'm not sure about is that I've got the only one in the New Testament, I'm pretty sure. And that's led to a lot of stuff like, well, it doesn't end with an amen because it's never over with. Like you are Acts 29. We're writing the 29th chapter. And that's clever. Um, I'm not sure that's what the author of Acts was thinking. I'm not going to put an amen on this because you're the church. Um, clever enough to talk about, sure. Um, but maybe no amen because perhaps it did just end and it wasn't supposed to. Um, maybe there was going to be more writing. Maybe when Luke stopped writing, he thought, I'll add another paragraph later, and he never did. Um, and it ends, we're going to get to its ending tonight. It ends abruptly, but it also ends perfectly when you consider that finally, at the very end of the book of Acts, we get this glimpse into what the gospel might look like inside the church. And maybe that's the way it's supposed to end because that's what we're supposed to hold on to. Because the church did this through the book of Acts, and it did this through the book of Acts. And as I've told you before, it depends on what part you pick in the book of Acts is what church you're going to look like. So maybe the whole composite is just supposed to end up with this last little salvo at the end of the book that says, here's what that message sounded like. And that way, that message can then just resonate through time. And then maybe that's the message we ought to preach. Because I don't know that we want to be Acts 2. And I don't know that we want to be Acts 4. And I don't know that we want to be Acts 8 or Acts 10 or Acts 15. But I don't think we have much choice but to be the last two verses of Acts 28. Because there's no amen. And because it's the point where we finally find out what is it that they preached. That's what we want to lead up to tonight. Our title, our subtitle, we're really titling all of this the church, but our subtitle tonight is Preach the Kingdom. And that's no shocker if you followed the ministry of Jesus. Jesus comes along preaching the kingdom. He preaches the kingdom is at hand. He preaches the kingdom of God is something you can acquire. We're going to glimpse at Jesus preaching the kingdom just a little bit tonight. And in preaching the kingdom, I want to try to dig down to what that might mean, not necessarily, because I've done this before. You and I have sat through this lesson where I've told you 
that Paul says the kingdom is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Good three-point sermon. What's the kingdom? It's righteousness, it's peace, it's joy in the Holy Spirit. It's not the tangible, it's the intangible. You've heard me say that. I could say it again, but I'm not going to be able to say it any differently. That's, that's the spiritual side of the kingdom, this idea that it's not the stuff I can get my hands on. It's the other. But what do we do with that? And what is our responsibility with that? And I think that's their preaching of the kingdom. Okay, let me get you there with this thought. The evolution of the gathering. When we say the word church, we're talking ecclesia. Ecclesia is called out ones. But it's a plural word. It's ones. You're one, you're one, you're one, you're one, I'm one. But together we're, we're the ones. Together, we, we, the, the pronoun changes. We, be, we are now in existence. The ecclesia is never the singular. The ecclesia is the plural. So the church isn't me. The church is you and me. But the church is not only you and me. The church is you, me, and you and on down the line, because it's all that are called out, but don't forget they're called out. So they're not like everyone else. And so there is something unique to being a part of the church, that you are not just run of the mill people. You are not just like anyone else on the street. The church marks you, makes you different. One of the things the church began to do was gather. They got together. They didn't have buildings. They didn't have parking lots. They didn't have buses, and I know they're in a different time, but they didn't even have their equivalencies of those things in their day. They didn't have anything. They had each other, and they had Jesus, and they had the invisible internal presence of the Holy Spirit. What were they going to do with that? I want to take you on the evolution of the gathering, and what I mean by the evolution of the gathering, I don't, this is kind of my 30,000 foot view I talked about, like, oh, we're going to pull back and show you some of this stuff in the book of Acts. But the truth is, is I don't want to go to every one of these verses because I don't think we'll learn any more for purposes of tonight by going to every verse. But I, So let's do it this way. Acts 2.46 tells us the church met from house to house. Notice I'm going in order here too, chronologically. And so the early church is meeting from one house to the next house. By the fifth chapter, the 42nd verse, they're meeting daily in the temple and in every house. Daily in the temple tells you that they were still holding on to their Jewishness. They're only Jews at this point. They're still holding on to their Jewishness, and yet they're still doing the house-to-house -house thing. By Acts chapter 8, the text says in verse 3 that Saul made havoc. Just another way of saying Saul comes in, starts killing people, arresting people. I don't know that Saul individually killed anyone. We don't have any evidence of that. But he arrests them and sends them to their death. And where does he do it? Entering every house. So by chapter 8, the word is out. These quote-unquote Christians, they're probably not called that yet. These members of the way, the resistance, whatever you want to call them, they're meeting in houses. You want to find them, go to the house. And so that's what Saul does. That causes a change of venue in Acts 10. By Acts chapter 10, verse 2, the church... I know this is, they're not actually the church of the house of Cornelius, but we're in another house with people meeting, seeking God, receiving the Holy Spirit, and for the first time in the book of Acts, it's a Gentile. So if you just watch the trend, house to house, Jewish temple and houses, that Jewish temple comes after them in the house, so the meetings start happening in private residences, quietly. Here it goes, Gentile, woman, possible Roman jailer, another woman, house of Titius Justus, definitely Roman. Can't get more Roman than that. Next door to the synagogue. So watch how the church sort of morphs. It's going house to house. It's hanging on to Judaism. Boom, here comes the, the hammer drops. People start dying. They get arrested. And the church sort of scatters, but it keeps going into houses. And I love how the Holy Spirit sort of accelerates the equality message. Here comes women. Here comes Romans. Here comes strangers. Here comes members of the empire. The gospel's reaching out, grabbing the unqualified. Unqualified by man's standards, by Jewish standards, by societal standards. I love how the gospel doesn't care. Like the church doesn't have all these rules yet. 
about who gets in, who gets out. And when they tried to enforce those rules, the Holy Spirit knocks down the doors. Like it goes, oh, go to Cornelius' house. I can give Gentiles the Holy Spirit. Um, woman, Roman, woman, Roman, Romans 16, 5 and 1 Corinthians 16, 19, the house of Priscilla and Aquila. And if that one doesn't strike you, it's just because those are names we don't use. But what ought to strike you is for the first time that I can see in the New Testament the woman's name before the man. It happens twice. This ain't Aquila's house, this is Priscilla's house. By the way, fun side note, Priscilla, there are some really interesting scholarly evidence for a Priscilla authorship of the book of Hebrews. Drop that little, drop that little nugget of goodness into your world. Can't prove it, can't disprove it. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila lead Apollos to Christ. Apollos is a popular candidate to have written the book of Hebrews as well. It seems like we keep trying to drop a lot of people in there not named Paul um, because it's not Pauline in the way it's written. So we're trying to find someone, but interesting stuff. So you got the, the evolution of the gathering. So notice all this stuff that's changing. This stuff that doesn't belong in the way Hebrews write. They don't, don't, doesn't belong in the way a Jew would write. It doesn't belong in the way we think it ought to progress Nympha's house, Philemon's house. Finally, in Revelation 21, the evolution of the gathering brings us all the way to a place called the New Jerusalem, what is known as the bride's or the, the Lamb's bride. And Revelation 21 3 actually says, the tabernacle of God in that day is with men. And I will just throw this in to say that I don't believe that Revelation 21 is trying to give you a projection of the future in a thousand years, two thousand years, five thousand years. I think it's trying to show you that is what we are, otherwise the tabernacle of God is not with men. And I don't believe God lives in heaven and you live on earth. Let me say that again, um, say it a little better. I don't believe God's over in the glory land and you're down here in hell. And that what God's trying to do is get you to heaven. Um, the whole reason that Jesus climbs the ladder to the cross is to bring the ladder of heaven to the earth so that God's presence can live amongst men. Here is where he dwells. So if in Revelation 21, what we're seeing is the place in which God's tabernacle dwells with men, that can't be 10,000 years in your future. Otherwise, God's tabernacle is not with men now. And Paul thought the church was the temple of the Holy Spirit. Tabernacle and temple, interchangeable words for purposes of that argument. So if the church is the temple of God, and God's temple is with men called the New Jerusalem, then the evolution of the gathering is house to house, it ends up being everywhere that we assemble together and anywhere that we assemble together and we put God in our midst. How do we do that? Jesus said, if two or three of you gather together in my name, I'm in the midst. Where does God live? Wherever you proclaim God in community. Now, he also lives inside of you, yes, but for purposes of the gathering, so when we walk into this little theater on a Tuesday evening in the name of Jesus, this is why it is important to me, it's more than semantics, but it's important to me that before this meeting is over, it be about the word and be done in the name of Jesus. And I start talking about Jesus early and often in these meetings when we, start, when we get up and running because it proclaims that we're here in his name. Therefore, it becomes the tabernacle of the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is who God is. The Holy Spirit has no reason to dwell in this room when you leave. It's not as if, he's, he, it's not as if he hangs out in here because we've developed a holy place. We have become the holy place and you and I together, assembled together, uh, can experience in community those things that can only be experienced in community. It's why the church kept gathering, even when they were persecuted, even they, when they were locked out, squeezed out, crushed, destroyed, in tribulation. Why didn't they just give up? Because I gotta be honest, a lot of us, and, I, and I'm, I, I said us, I didn't say you, and I didn't say anybody else. A lot of us have so many years, so many centuries of personal salvation has been preached to us, personal Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That if we underwent a lot of persecution, we'd go, forget that, man. I can stay home and be a Christian. And the early church went, wait a minute. This isn't how this works. 
We're not a bunch of solo Christians. I have to have you in my life. I have to be able to fellowship with you. I have to, not for money's sake, because I'm afraid sometimes the only reason we get together is money, because we got something to pay for. We got people to pay. We got stuff to pay off. If you get rid of the money equation and the must, do we, the must, the have to, do we still have reason for community? And I think we have to separate ourselves a little bit from this personal salvation. I don't mean we don't need to know that we're personally saved, but separate ourselves a little bit from its dependency so that we become more dependent, more co-dependent for what codependency gives us. In other words, maybe you're the foot and you're the hand and you're the elbow and you may not think that's much, but lose your foot or your hand or your elbow and then tell me if that's much. And that's how the church should be viewed is to say, oh, I may not feel like I have the greatest job, but, I, but I'm needed and you're needed because of what we provide to each other and because, because what you give to me and what I give to you. And so let's talk house for a second. The house, I put in, air, I put in quotes because that's a word that pops up in Acts in that 30,000 foot view, house, 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 house. The house was a necessity because they didn't have buildings. They had to meet somewhere, right? You already got a house. Just come to my home. But it's also the place we live. The house is not the place we visit. The church is best lived, not merely attended. The reason I bring this up is because it keeps bringing up houses over and over and over and over again. It's rare that they meet in neutral sites in the book of Acts. Like they have the upper room in Acts 2, they receive the Holy Spirit, but they don't keep going back to the upper room. We would. Give them credit, man. We would run right back to the upper room next week, start a church called Upper Room Fellowship. Pentecost, you know, is here or whatever and, and, and sell DVDs of it or stream it live. And I know we're in a different era, but they, they didn't... It, I think that there's a motif being set up in the background in the book of Acts House is the place you live. It's the place that you are loved. It's the place you're accepted. It's the place that you receive your family. It's the place that you entertain strangers. It's the place you're most comfortable. It is not the place you visit. And so the motif is being set up in the book of Acts to show us that the church meets in the place of family because the church is a family. And that it is not about where you go. It is about who you welcome into the place of your comfort into the place of your family. That brings me to the end of the book of Acts because I want to try to land on one more house, this one a rented house, and I want to land on what I think might be the two-pronged idea of what Acts is trying to tell us we ought to preach because it doesn't end with an amen. So what we can assume is maybe we're supposed to do something with that. Acts 28, 30. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him. So he had his own little church anytime somebody show up. And what does he do? Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. There almost seems to be this note of triumph at the end of the book of Acts because if you've read Acts, it's been chapter after chapter after chapter of opposition to Paul. Even the church kicked him out. And you get to the end of the book and it's like, he, it's like he's vindicated. He goes, okay, nobody wants me. I'll rent my own house. I'll preach two things. Anyone can come that wants to. No one can stop me from preaching it. And there's the end sort of of that book that, that just then lays out there for all of us. And I think um, it helps us with this establishment. We've established the church met in homes. We've also talked about why that was necessary. And in earlier weeks in our study, we've seen the content of their meetings, that they broke bread, that they prayed, that they fellowshiped, and that they taught the word. Here's my question. What did they actually preach? And we don't have CDs. We don't have MP3s files of what happened. We do have a few word-for-word -word sermons in the book of Acts, but for the most part, those are evangelistic sermons. Like we don't know what, we don't get a lot of stuff that's going on in your average house meeting in the book of Acts. Like nobody bothered to take notes and say, Paul was, the, uh, the great Peter was with us tonight and here's what he said and write it down. 
Instead, it's evangelistic. Like if he goes to Cornelius' house, they wrote that down. If they stand on the street and they preach to the heathens, they write some of that down. If they're going to stone Stephen to death, they take the time to write his sermon down. But we don't get the day-to-day -day stuff. So you get to the end of the book of Acts, you have Paul sitting here, and he's letting people into his house, and he's preaching two things, which is fascinating. Because that doesn't seem like much for a guy so smart. Why just two things? Until you break down what those two things are. So before we break that down, let's answer this question. What are they preaching? Well, they don't have a New Testament, first of all. So scratch that out of your mind. They're not preaching Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Paul might be rehashing the things he's writing to the Ephesus, to the Philippian, to the Colossian, to the Galatian churches in Corinth and Thessalonica. But I don't have any reason to believe that Paul's made copies of his letters and he's handing them out of the door going, okay, tonight I'm going to speak to you from the middle of my first Corinthian letter. We don't have any reason to believe that's how he would have done it. So he doesn't have the New Testament to work off of. He does have the Hebrew Bible, what we would call the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures. And he probably has some other books that he pulls from. What he told Timothy was the scriptures. And when he said the scriptures, he's talking Old, Old Testament for all intents and purposes. You know what else he doesn't do? He's not promoting Judaism, so what in the world is he doing with the Old Testament? Because he's not telling them how to live the law. He's not preaching the feast days and, and, and teaching them how to honor the Sabbath and whether they should tithe. And he's not taking them back to animal sacrifices. And he's not prophetically speaking towards a Jesus to come. So he's not promoting his old Judaism. We know that if you've ever read Philippians 3, you can be confident he's not promoting old Judaism. If you've ever read the book of Galatians, you know he would never promote old Judaism. And so he's not doing that. He doesn't have a New Testament to work off of. So what does he have? He has essentially two things. Preach the kingdom. And number two, teach the things concerning Jesus. This is what I want to talk about tonight. Now, honestly, I really, really only want to emphasize preach the kingdom for the purpose that I think there's some things about the kingdom we're just straight out, flat out getting wrong. And I'm no genius, like I got it nailed. I'm the biggest duck in the pond of getting some things wrong in the kingdom, and we're going to go down that road tonight. But I don't want to ignore the second one, but I'm going to go out of order. This is the order they're in in the scripture. It says he preached the kingdom, taught things concerning Jesus. But I want to talk about the second one first. And when I mean talk about it, no screens, no scriptures, just me talking to you about the fact that I think teach the things concerning Jesus is an overlooked, forgotten part of the pulpit. I'll say in the American church, because I don't know what they're doing around the world, not with Jesus. I, I don't. I, I, can get, I got Twitter just like you do, and I, I can watch YouTube videos just like you can, but if you're not boots on the ground probably don't know. I am boots on the ground. The American church at least have been for a while. And I've been to a lot of churches and I talk to a lot of people and I talk to a lot of ministers and I see a lot of ministries and so do you because you have the same access. And I think you know as well as I do, teaching the things concerning Jesus is like the seasonal sermon series, mm -hmm. not the Sunday go to meeting every week. I mean, when we teach the things concerning Jesus, it's its own set. It's not the underpinnings of what we do. In fact, and I said this last week in this room, we've become so infatuated with the teachings of Paul that we actually read Jesus through the lens of Paul rather than the other way around. And I think that's a tragedy. So what we'll do is we'll read Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount and we'll go, yeah, but Paul said as if Jesus is subservient to Paul. When we, what we ought to do is read Paul and then say, but Jesus said, so what should we follow? I don't mean we kick Paul out, Peter, James, John, any of them. I mean, we take Jesus first because we're followers of Christ. Our message is essentially a resurrected Christ and that he's alive and that he is real and that we believe it and that it's affecting us, and we filter everything else through it. And so what ought to be taught are the things concerning Jesus. So I would say this. Every one of us as followers of Christ need to spend time with Jesus. And I don't just mean in a um, 
spiritual sort of invisible. Um, I just did a sermon. I just put a sermon up this week called Managing Distractions. That message about Mary and Martha. Martha's cooking in the kitchen and Mary's at Jesus' feet. And I spent time in that message talking about how Martha's distracted. But I intentionally in that message didn't just sit and hammer on, sit at Jesus' feet, read your Bible, dwell on it, pray, concentrate, meditate. Because I think sometimes we've made sit at the feet of Jesus too invisible. This, like this thing you do on Sunday in your quiet moment at the altar. And that's all your battery recharging is running up to the front, spending a couple quiet minutes with Jesus. I'm not even talking about that. When I say we need to spend our time with Jesus, maybe we should parcel out how much time we're giving to the other scriptures and never let any of it get up there on par with how much we're reading about Jesus. That everything else, Old Testament, Paul, prophecy, all of it, should never approach how much we've been reading the Gospels. I don't think we live in them the way that you would think we would, seeing as we're called Christians. <laughs> like we follow Christ, and the biggest part of our diet, I mean, let's don't, let's don't, Let's don't paint it any other way. Let's just be plain about it. The biggest part of our diet ought to be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How could it not be? It's actually the stories about Jesus. It's actually someone sat down and wrote down, hey, Jesus did this. Now you could sit and fight about whether it was literal or allegorical or metaphorical or whatever, historical. You're following a resurrected Jesus. Don't you know what you signed up for? You actually believe he's alive. So hearing more about him ought to feed your soul. Teach the things concerning Jesus. All right, that's all I'll say about that. Let's move on to preach the kingdom. What did Jesus think the kingdom looked like? Let's start there. Luke 17, 20. Jesus says this. He was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, and he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Literally, in the Greek, it's what it sounds like. The kingdom of God is not something that comes by you being able to see it. All right? It is not something that comes by lifting up your eyes. And that's why they're not going to be able to say, see here or see there. Like, look, that's the kingdom. Look, that's the kingdom. Oh, here comes the kingdom. And he says, the reason they can't do it is twofold. One, it doesn't come that way. Two, kingdom of God's inside of you. Okay, so you, you know, it's not something you lift up your eyes and see. But it's also something that's already there. The, 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 Greek word, the Greek phrase here, and I've said this to you before, is very ambiguous. Jesus could mean the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus could mean the kingdom of God is in your midst right here. Um, we don't know exactly because the Greek is open-ended right there. So all we can say is, with certainty, the kingdom can't be something you can see in the way you can see kingdoms of the earth. But it's no less a kingdom. How's that possible? What does that look like? All right. We're going to work on that. What did Paul say? Read Paul through Jesus, not the other way around. What do we have? Jesus said, not going to be able to see it. It's in your midst. Here's how Paul handles that in light of how Jesus handles it. Colossians 1.13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and has conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love has conveyed done deal paul's not prophesying someday i'm going to a place called the kingdom aka heaven because that's how most christians read the kingdom by the way when they read kingdom in the bible they say heaven in fact i would project that most of us read about the kingdom all the way through our christianity and thought it was talking about heaven right lest man be born again he shall not Enter the kingdom. See the kingdom. How do we take that? Here's how we said it. Unless man gets saved, he ain't going to heaven. Jesus didn't say either one of those things. <laughs> Jesus said, unless man's born again, he doesn't get to see the kingdom. The kingdom can only be seen through new eyes. Because your old eyes will never see the kingdom. Why? Because Luke 17, 20, the kingdom doesn't come with observation. That tells me not only can you not see the kingdom in the way you can see the kingdoms of the world, you can't see the kingdom because you're using the wrong eyeballs. Because you're using natural eyes, you can't see the kingdom of God with natural eyes. 
unless a man's born again, unless his eyes are new, unless he enters into a new birth, he's not going to be able to see the kingdom. What kingdom? The kingdom that you've been conveyed into, the kingdom of the son of his love. And so, and then we could get into a whole theology of what born again looks like in light of Christ's resurrection. We'll leave that there for now. Instead, I'm actually going to land. I know, not a long lesson tonight, but I'm actually going to land in the next few minutes on a, on a series of statements, all right? Having laid out for you the scriptural case, and this has been a, a very thin scriptural case, and the reason it's been very thin is you and I, I've taught the kingdom to you guys a lot. I've hit, I think, every kingdom scripture you can hit in the New Testament in this room between Tuesday nights and monthly meetings <laughs> over four plus years. I've probably preached every kingdom text I can preach. Um, they're all out there. I'm not up here trying to, to uh, cram them all into one lesson. And that's why we're just doing a few. But I want to say some stuff about the kingdom that spoke pretty loud in my spirit this week. And I want to say it to me as much as I want to say it to you. And I want to say it to you that are watching. Because maybe you're someone who thinks the kingdom is heaven. I hope I've at least caused you to rethink that. I probably... Maybe I haven't convinced you, but you're at least now going, hmm, what if it's not just a place over there? I mean, Jesus thought it wasn't a place you could see, and he thought it was a place in your midst, and Paul thought you were already there. So if you just went to that point, I might not have convinced you, but I might have made you not be able to see it the same way again. That's a pretty good spot, okay? So that leaves us in a very difficult position. And this is that position, to best I can say it. That if the kingdom is something that we have, something we're in, then what in the world are we doing? And this doesn't make Christianity flimsier or shallower. It might make it deeper. It might make it something we aren't ready to think about or wrestle with. And that is a good place for all of us to spend some time. So let's think about it through some different lenses, all right? Let's start here. Kingdom is a proclamation, not a project. Let me start with that thought. The kingdom is a proclamation, not a project. You are not a kingdom builder. If you are a kingdom builder, you are in a project of building something. But the kingdom is not something we build. Jesus doesn't invite you to build the kingdom. Jesus invites you to seek the kingdom. He said you'll have it. He doesn't say build it, he says seek it. If it's something you can build, it's something you can see. If it's something you can build, it's something you can defend. But it isn't yours to build. It's not a project. It's a proclamation. We're not building it, we're living it. We are to proclaim that it has arrived and then live it out on the earth. So we're living it, proclaiming it and living it, not building it. Building your local church is not building the kingdom. I know it feels like it. And I know we say it because it gives us something tangible. Like, what are we doing out here this week for the Lord? We're trying to build the kingdom of God. Too late. The kingdom's here. It's not a project that needs another floor on it. That each generation is just adding a new wing. Got a new elevator going in. New campus of the kingdom. No. I'm proclaiming the kingdom of God has come in a man named Jesus. And then I'm living that out. Now, I might be building something, but it ain't the kingdom. And I, didn't mean, I don't mean you got to tear it down. We do build things. And that's okay. We just can't confuse what we're building with the kingdom. And we build stuff all the time. And what you build might even be a great thing. But it's never the kingdom of God. God's in the kingdom building business. We're in the proclaiming business. We can no more build the kingdom than we can build heaven. And no one says we're building heaven. People say we're populating heaven. We're filling heaven. You're not even doing that. How many people do you save? You don't save anyone. You don't fill heaven at all. None of us are bringing, actually bringing people from darkness to light. We're just proclaiming, proclaiming good news, proclaiming Jesus is alive, proclaiming the kingdom of God. Hopefully not shallow and only talk, hopefully living it. Because if it's only talk, it's only going to last so long. Because people have been talked to death, and there are professional talkers. 
and people that know how to say things to move you. But the proclamation of the kingdom looks like the Jesus. This is why Paul's preaching the kingdom and teaching the things concerning Christ because at the end of the day, they are the same thing. So the kingdom is full of the things that pertain to Christ, not full of the things that pertain to me. Let's think about it this way. Perhaps we think of church as a place that we go because we're already thinking of the kingdom as a place that we go. Or as I wrote, we're already thinking of the kingdom as a destination. Therefore, the church is a destination. So let's flip that around. If the kingdom was a reality that we live out, then the gathering of kingdom people would be something we live out as well. So the church would be less about where I go and more about what I am if the kingdom was less about where I'm going and more about how I'm living. So I think we've fallen into go to church mentality because we think kingdom is heaven and where are we going when we die? Heaven. You'll get 100% answer on that if you go into the church. Cross denominations, doesn't matter. But where are we going when we die if we're Christians? Everybody go, heaven. I'm not saying they're wrong. But if you then push the envelope and go, we're going to the kingdom or we're going to the kingdom of heaven, most of us would then have it out in front of us instead of something that we possess. The whole reason I'm bringing this up is because the church, the evolution of the church gathering, it ends up at the end of the book of Acts with a guy preaching the kingdom and teaching the things concerning Jesus. And that was the whole message of that whole church era. That was, the, that was all they had left. Preach the kingdom of God, teach the things concerning Jesus, all one and the same. Not merely as a place to go, but as a thing to be. And then this. Three little things on this screen. Start here. We fall into a trap of thinking that we are giving people a preview of what the kingdom will be like. I've, we, I've said this before. Let's go out here and live and show people what the kingdom is going to look like. Let's love them. Let's accept them. Let's embrace them the way the kingdom will be. That's a trap. Because this assumes that the kingdom is not yet. You should live the kingdom not as a preview. You should live the kingdom as a presentation. I am not showing you the way it will be. I am showing the way it is in God's economy. Not someday. Showing the way it is in God's economy right now. This is why loving people has always been the kingdom agenda. God's not waiting someday to do that. God is trying to do that through the gathering. It's why I, I say the safest place in the world to be should be the gathering. You get to come in and be loved unconditionally just as you are. You go, yeah, but will people change? Sure, I, I, hope, I hope I change, to be honest with you. But it doesn't make my father love me more or less if I don't, or if I do. And it shouldn't cause any difference in the church as to whether or not you are loved or you accepted. Because the kingdom is not about entering once you've changed. It's entering once you tell and do the truth. Entrance to the kingdom is the doing of the truth. It's being what you really are. And the kingdom is an open arms. Not as a preview of how it shall be someday, but as a presentation of how it is in Him. That leads me to this thought. Don't be more concerned with getting people saved than loving people well. Okay? Let me say that again. Don't be more concerned with getting people saved than with loving people well because the kingdom is about loving people like Jesus loved them. And if all the church is doing is trying to quote unquote get people saved, it will traffic in morality preaching. We will traffic morality. Moralisms will become our thing because it's the only way we can tell if people are saved. Because you don't know. So what we'll have to do is set up a bunch of parameters that will show us if people are saved. Now it's going to depend on where you land. Now you might shake your head or your heart and go, we're not that way. It's just going to depend on where you land. Depends on what church you're in. In some places, it's going to have to do with your hair length and your skirt length and your shirt length and the way you spend your money and what you do in private. And those are the parameters. In other places, it's going to have to do with what gifts of the Spirit are being manifested in you, how you were baptized, 
what kind of Bible translation you read. We have to have a way to figure out if you're saved if we're going to traffic in salvations being what the church is about. But if we concerned ourselves less with figuring out if people are quote unquote saved and more with whether or not people knew the love of God, we would not need an external manifestation of their change in order to know we're loving them. We would need an active change in us to know that we're loving them. And change has to begin here. It can't be expected to begin there. Which is why when people come in and we say, we want people to change, it ought to be flipped on us. When they come in, our change ought to be actively happening because our change is figuring out how to properly express the unconditional love of a satisfied God to people that walk through the door. How do I do that? I'm having a hard time doing that. Well, then that's on me. That's not your problem. You go, this guy makes it hard for me to love. Well, that's on you. That's not on that guy. If you can't figure out how to love, then you need to go back to Jesus and ask him what he would do. And here's what he's going to say. And I can't speak for him. That's why you spend time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what you're going to find is John says that Jesus says, a new commandment that I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So figure out how much I love you and then go love people like that. This is why we struggled with Love God, love people. Love Lord your God with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two, Jesus said, hang the law and the prophets. Well, it's still hard to do because nothing. I was praying about this this morning on my run. There's nothing in that. The first five commandments is, is, is this way. The second five commandments is this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, soul, mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Great. Wonderful. But there's nothing in there that really settles my heart on how much he loves me. None of it. And then comes Jesus. And he shows us the love of the Father. And he says, love as I've loved. How did I love? I laid myself down. I did not come to be served, but to serve. That's our only equipment. That's the all the equipment that we need. And so I then know how to love because I receive his love. As I receive his love and send that love out, I'm presenting the kingdom, not as it will be, but as it is. Let me say that again. Don't think of this as preaching the kingdom as it will be, but preach it as it is. Let me give you two ways of thinking. Two words. Maybe this is how we should think about the kingdom. Just two simple words. Participate. Announce. Think about the kingdom in those two words this week. I'm to participate in the kingdom and I'm to announce its arrival. I'm not here to build it. I'm not here to promote it. I'm not here to prophesy it in. I'm not here to bring it in. I'm not here to live it in, pray it in, fast it. It's in. It's here. I'm here to participate in the loving God of the kingdom and to announce its arrival to every person that I see. That's all I can do. I don't build it. He's, he's perfectly capable. He's going to do fine without me. But I'm here as a recipient of his love to love my neighbor, not just to make my world a better place. Maybe that happens. But that's a tall task too, to make the world a better place. But it isn't too tall a task to ask to love, especially when the love we're giving is the love we've received from Jesus and who he is. So, preach the kingdom, teach the things concerning Jesus. There's no amen at the end of Acts. Maybe, maybe the no amen is because we're living Acts 29. But maybe how we should think of it is, there was two things left to be said, Jesus and the kingdom. I present that we preach about Jesus some when we think we either need to get people saved or need to get people to live right. And I don't think we preach the kingdom at all because we think that the kingdom is the place you're going if you meet Jesus. 
and that once you've met Jesus, then it depends on what kind of church you're in. In some places, once you've met Jesus, then you climb the ladder and get to the kingdom. In other places, once you've met Jesus, you're guaranteed to go to the kingdom. So why preach either one? I don't know why we do what we do. I don't know why we preach what we preach or don't preach what we preach. I know that we need to wrestle in our own lives how we're going to present and announce the kingdom of God. And I think it should start with loving our neighbor the way Jesus did and laying our lives down for them as Jesus did. And we'll see that manifested in gathering. And in that, I think, I do think there's, there's salvation and hope for the world. And I think it starts at the church. And I don't mean the building. I think it starts at the gathering of those who teach the things concerning Jesus and proclaim and live out the kingdom. Let's pray. Father, I thank you tonight for the word and, and for the excitement of seeing Jesus. I hope that, Father, we have shined the spotlight on Christ and that we have landed in such a way that such a way that puts you in the center and us wherever else we belong. And may we not just leave you here on this evening, but we take you with us and not go out and try to build anything this week. We're not trying to build your kingdom. You're doing fine. It is finished. But proclaiming the kingdom of God as a reality that we get to participate in and that we get to announce. And we thank you for that as you teach us what that looks like. In Jesus' name, amen.